It was it, almost a reality now. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we could see very much this sort of thing. And so we had this vision of workstations that had high-resolution bitmap graphics and mice and networks tying them together and laser printers and file servers and just what you see beginning to happen. Uh, people thought it would be coming around 1980, to, to about the point we are now. So we were a little optimistic, I think, by about five years. Well, what is the, what is the relationship to, between the work that was done at Xerox and the work that took off, say, in Apple with uh, Lisa and the Macintosh? How did that work out? Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was that our research group at Park uh, was developing a system called Smalltalk, mm -hmm. which was actually intended for educational users. I also spent part of my time working with a group that was developing systems for business users, so I got involved in both projects. Uh, around 1980, it became pretty clear that uh, Xerox was going to focus their attention entirely on a certain segment of the marketplace with fairly high-end workstations like the Star. Mm -hmm. And my personal interest was in personal computing. And there were a few others at Xerox with a similar interest. So several of us all moved to Apple and uh, brought with us this, these, uh, this inspiration to pursue the small talk work, which was well known in the academic community, but it wasn't really uh, being taken advantage of right. by any okay. manufacturers. It's interesting now that Apple is trying to move into that office automation area. Mm -hmm. Ben, yeah. is, uh, what do you think about the Xerox Star? Is that uh, a viable well, It's still very much a live product. I don't, not people are aware of its history, but it has gone through five major software revisions. Uh, the pricing has changed quite a bit, and the performance is substantially improved and uh, broadened from what it was before. But its emphasis has been as a business system. So, so it's, a, it's something we just don't really see in this market. Right. Uh, what about the future? What, where is this thing going? What, are we, what kind of things? You, you had a good vision, uh, say, 10 years ago. What's going to happen in the next 10 years as far as this? Well, I think there'll be some improvements still in visual presentation and pointing devices. But I think the main change we'll be seeing is in the area of communications, the ability for... Uh, information in corporate databases to be downloaded into personal computers and actually usefully processed. The ability for people to prepare routine work to have it done for them by their machine. To have uh, what we call an agent in the machine which represents you in transactions with other individuals. Sounds, sounds like we're going in a lot of good yeah. directions. Gentlemen, <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you. Okay. The Apple Macintosh has received an unheard of kind of notoriety, things like the famous 1984 commercial in the Super Bowl, the Lemmings commercial, which we just saw some time ago. Yet we heard on this program that the whole media hype may be a problem for Apple as it approaches this business market. Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on Apple's media image. The two Macs in this world, the Apple Macintosh and the McDonald's Big Mac, have a lot in common. They're both over-advertised, shiny boxes whose contents disappoint. Now look, I know the people that designed the Apple Macintosh say they meant it to be a business machine from the start. And I know they say there's now hundreds of business software packages available for the Macintosh. But that doesn't convince me. You can call a mouse an elephant for a week if you want. You can even take out full-page ads in the paper. In the end, both are going to be gray and both will have tails, but anyone who takes a close look is going to be able to tell the difference. Apple wants the Macintosh to be taken seriously in the office, and I'm sorry, but I just don't think that's ever going to happen. The machine is wonderful, but it's flawed. It's too expensive, it isn't fast enough, and it's in black and white. I just don't get it. Apple used the world's finest technology in the Mac and produced a machine with an entertaining disk drive sound that users spend too much time listening to. It's got a small screen, it's great for graphics, but it's overkill for words and data. I like Apple. I wish them good luck in breaking IBM's hegemony over the personal computer market. I just don't think Mac is the answer. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, reports that AT&T is finally about to come out with its new Model 7300, the machine it is betting on in its battle with IBM. The PC7300 will be a Unix-based machine, able to handle multi-users between 4 and 9, depending on the software. The basic 7300 comes with 512K, expandable up to 2 megabytes. It will feature icons, a mouse, and a built-in phone. The 7300 will replace the 6300, which is an IBM compatible. Meanwhile, in Boca Raton, rumors are that IBM will soon be announcing the PC2, reportedly a lower-cost version of the AT. 
The PC-2 will essentially replace the PC and the XT. Sources say the new PC-2 could be priced around $1,000. Morrow Computers has announced a new 25-line version of its Pivot portable computer. And to keep sales of the 16-line model going, Morrow has cut the price on the Pivot by $1,000. Current owners can upgrade the original Pivot by paying the extra $1,000. Commodore is finally showing its new lap portable. It's got 16 lines by 80 columns, a built-in modem, business software in ROM, and 32K of RAM. It's expected to sell for under $600. And new details coming out on the upcoming Atari 130ST. The basic 128K model will sell for around $400. It will feature DRI's gem user interface with icons, windows, and pull-down menus. And Atari says it will offer a 10 megabyte hard disk for $600. On this week's software review, Paul takes a look at TopView, the new IBM user interface. You know, people can easily do two things at once, like talk on the phone and take notes. But one of the most frustrating things about PCs is that they can only do one thing at a time. Use your modem, forget about your word processor. IBM noticed this, so they came up with a multitasking operating system called TopView. Well, TopView is easy to use, but it's hard to install unless you want to buy all your software from IBM. Now, IBM says you need 256K of memory, two floppies, and no mouse. I say you need more like 512K of memory, a hard disk, and a mouse for sure. Using the cursor keys with TopView is like trying to scrub your screen with a toothbrush. Now, no one would say that IBM ignored the color capabilities of the PC when it wrote TopView. Here's a few screens of the tutorial which comes with TopView. It is by far the easiest way to learn how to use the program. Like everyone else, IBM assumes you'd rather not use DOS, so it provides a DOS helper called DOS Services. TopView's problem? It has to be made aware of your programs. Now, IBM makes this easy for their software and harder for software from elsewhere. As more programs become TopView aware, this problem should go away, making it easier to spend $149 for IBM's TopView. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. The IRS has fouled up again, this time delaying tax refunds due to problems with its new computer system. The feds are about 5 million refunds behind last year's schedule due to installation and training problems associated with its new $100 million computer setup. If you always wanted to run your own computer store, it may be getting easier. Computerland has just announced drastic cuts in the cost of a franchise. It used to be $75,000. You can now get in for $15,000 or less. There's a new entry in the optical scanner market. Oberon International has come up with a low-cost print reader called OmniReader. It scans text and enters it into your computer as a text file. The price is under $500. First, there were magazines for machines, Macworld, PC World, and so on. But now there is a new magazine for one piece of software, Lotus. The new Lotus magazine is due out in a few weeks. It will be a monthly. Lotus says its new magazine will start with a circulation of 300,000. In Florida, the computer has replaced the ball and chain. Palm Beach County law officials are using a computerized radio transmitter strapped to a prisoner's ankle to track prisoners who are serving their sentences out in the community. Any attempt to leave the county or remove the transmitter triggers an alarm on an IBM PC back at headquarters. The world's first computerized restaurant opened this week in Palo Alto. MacArthur Park waiters are now using small, palm-sized computer terminals to enter orders. As the waiter pushes the buttons on the handheld unit, the orders print out at terminals in the kitchen. The new system is made by a startup called Validec. They say computerized ordering will speed up service and enable one waiter to cover more tables. I think I'll tip via home banking. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. See you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.